So let us uh, start today with a bit of a history uh, which is also the story of exactly how and why these kind of rings that I described yesterday were studied and uh, that factorization of numbers into primes and the problems thereof was found. So, this is related to Fermat's last theorem. Now, how many of you have heard about this Fermat's last theorem? Anyone? No? You have heard of it? It states that uh, there are no solutions of the equation in integers whenever n is greater than or equal to 3. So, this was a statement that was or a hypothesis which was made by Pierre de Fermat who was a mathematician in the 17th century. This is a very interesting statement because when n equals 2, then x square plus y square is equal to z square has lots of solutions 3 square plus 4 square is equal to 5 square being one of them. But as soon as n becomes 3 or higher number, there are no solutions that is the claimed by this and uh, it was such a nice and simple statement and so intriguing that it attracted a lot of attention. In fact, Pharma in his uh, a, he was studying a book by Euclid and in the margin of that book he wrote this statement and also wrote that I have found a very ingenious proof of this statement, but this margin is too small to write that proof down and soon after he died. So, he could never write down his proof and this became a big mystery to all other mathematicians exactly what was that proof of Fermat that he could not write down. And over centuries a number of mathematicians tried to find the proof that elusive you proof, but none of them succeeded. The theorem was finally proved after more than 300 years in uh, 1995 about 20 years ago using some very advanced mathematics, but that is not really what I am talking about today. I am talking about a proof that was or rather a flawed proof that was found of this long time ago around uh, 19th century and that proof went like this. Let us consider the ring So, you take this complex number and then just like we did last time at introduce or add this into the set of integer and look at all the numbers you can form with this. These are going to be a subset of complex numbers. Now, if you look at this x to the n plus y to the n, the left hand side of this equation. I can write it as yeah I can just take y to the n out in common x by y to the n plus 1 
and this num a number raised to the n plus 1 this will factor in this ring in a nice way. What is the property of omega n? Omega n is e to the pi i by n then omega n to the n is e to the pi i and what is e to the pi i? Minus 1. So, omega to the n is minus 1 okay, and omega to the 2 n is plus 1. So, this will factor as this being exactly the one of the values of x by y would be omega n, but there will be many values. In fact, omega n cube also will satisfy this property that is nth power is minus 1. So, in fact you can see omega n, omega n cube, omega n to the 5 essentially all odd powers of omega n will satisfy this that its nth power is minus 1. All even powers will satisfy that their nth power is plus 1. So, I can factor this as and this therefore equal to x minus omega n y x minus omega n cube y and each one of this is in, in number in this ring. And now since I have this being equal to z to the n this would mean that this product equals z multiplied z is an integer which is multiplied with itself n times. These are also numbers. So, z is an integer in this ring and these are also in numbers in this ring. So, the same number is being written as a product in two different ways now. If unique factorization holds in this ring then the only way it is possible is that the numbers further get factored out. Each of this number gets further factored into other numbers. Similarly, the z here also gets factored into other numbers and all of them then the two sides then essentially the primes in this when you write z to the n in terms of product of primes in this this also in terms of product of primes in this it comes out to be the same. And then it was shown that that is not the case that factorize these numbers factor into primes which are of a kind different than these integer z factoring into primes in this ring. And this would hold whenever n was 3 or more. Now, what does that mean? That means this equation cannot be satisfied. There is no x, y, z which satisfies this equation because if it did exist, then we will have this two factorizations, two distinct factorizations of the same number in this ring, and that is not possible. So, mathematicians of 19th century implicitly assume that in this ring there will be unique factorization and based on this assumption they this was a very short proof that Fermat's last theorem is true. And many actually thought that this is the proof that Fermat also found. The only problem was and in fact this was published everybody was very happy and then suddenly somebody found and or rather observed that this ring has a problem that is a number can be factorized in this ring in two different ways. Just like 
we had that z square root of minus 5 two different ways of factorizing and suddenly the whole proof broke down and of course one if you can factorize number in two completely different ways then this argument does not work. So, in summary No unity factorization for n greater than equal to 3. So, this brought to the notice of the community that there are rings of numbers which rings of integers of a more general kind where the unique factorization into primes does not hold. This was a very, very unusual situation. It uh, made a lot of people very uncomfortable that how can this be? Now these what are these? These are these are not these certainly are numbers, but numbers must have this nice property of unique factorization and they do not have. So, a lot of effort was made trying to restore this unique factorization property. And the mathematician who finally was able to do was uh, Martin Kumer, I believe, who introduced what are called ideal numbers in these rings of numbers, using which he restored the unique factorization property. Now, ideal numbers, which I will describe sh shortly, got uh, more nicely captured as or shortened as ideals and ideals have come since then come to acquire a very, very important place in the theory of rings. Okay. So, that is the story and that is how this addition general ring of numbers was initially considered and uh, this structure of this ring is uh, needs to be understood other than because we would like to see exactly how these rings behave. As you can see that this gets intimately this ring is intimately connected to a very nice question about integers. In order to resolve this question about integers we have naturally introduced this ring. So, that is kind of a another example of what I claimed earlier right in the beginning of this course that these abstractions once you do it once you study them will help us in proving things about you no know, things of real life of that are of real interest to us problems about integers are of course interesting. So, one would like to prove them and then this is one way of doing it. Let us take another example of another type of ring. Let us say we want to answer the question find solutions of the equation. square equals y square plus 2. 
So essentially, you want to know the pair, and this is the solutions of integers. This answers the question of, or addresses the question of whether two squares are separated by number two, number two uh, value two. Okay, and we want to find a solution to this. How would you go about finding a solution? You have a strategy in mind? Yeah? Factorize, factorize x square minus y square. So, x minus y and x plus y. Okay? So, then you have a very good, excellent. So, you factorize simple solution. You have x minus y square which is x minus y x plus y which is 2. So, we have two integers which whose product is 2. So, one of them has to be 1 other has to be 2 and then you just write down all the solution. Excellent. Next example. made x square to x cube. This is asking the question if a cube and a square differ by 2. Now, that factorization trick would not work. I mean x cube minus y square you cannot factorize. So, what can one do? Well, here why not factorize the right hand side y square plus 2. Plus I root 2 or minus I root 2. Sorry? See, we want to find imaginary number is not allowed as a value of x and y. That is correct. We have to find integer values. Now, we want to find a way to derive these solutions. Now, in order to find that way, there is no restriction. We can use any which way. So, since this idea that once if you can factorize both sides, then and then you can can equate the side as the factors. That is the idea which was used here in x square x minus y times x plus y equals 2 that is a very simple factorization got it as a result very quickly. Here I am trying to use the same idea. The only difference is that now I have moved from the domain of integers to a larger ring of integer. This is the ring z square root of minus 2. That is a ring that had occurred last time also. Okay. Of course, we again come to this issue of unique factorization being there in this. Can this be factorized? Can there be unique factorization in this ring? It turns out that in this ring the unique factorization holds. It requires certain effort to prove, but uh, and I will not make that effort you have to just believe me. It is not very difficult to prove, but it just requires some calculations to show that the unique factorization does hold in this ring. The whole point being that the knowledge or extension to this bigger rings will help or does help us in answering questions about integers, the questions of the kind we are interested in. 
so this show shows a gives us a reason why we would like to study this larger rings of numbers in general rings so let's continue a bit more out of towards this so since unique factorization holds we'll have x cube equals this this two products okay now of course we have to see is it possible that these numbers further factor into something that is always possible that but that will depend on the value of y which is what we need to find out however there is one thing we can do which is to look at these two factors and ask the question do they have a non trivial gcd okay so suppose a number t divides y plus square root of minus 2 and t divides y minus square root of minus 2 they have a common factor remember t is in this ring okay because this is the ring over which we are now operating then what then it follows that this implies that t divides 2y and t divides the difference which is 2 square root of minus 2 so this limits the possibilities of t so t can only be now of course i have to see what are the primes in this ring so let me give you a trick to find out a number whether a number is prime in a ring like this and that trick involves using norms so let's just consider this following a plus b square root square root of minus 2 sorry okay define norm of this to be a square plus 2b square and now the claim is if norm of a plus b square root of minus 2 is prime in z then then that number is prime in z square root minus 2 this is a very simple rule let's see if you can discover it suppose norm is prime and further suppose this is not prime then it factors ah i should give you a okay though i cannot expect you to prove it immediately because there is one more fact that we must know that if you have a number so let's denote by n of the number to be represent the norm then norm happens to be multiplicative this can be verified very simply you just multiply this out compute the norm on both sides and see that's as simple as that it will turn out that it's actually multiplicative which is a very nice property particularly with respect to finding if a number is prime in this 
because if now suppose that a plus b square root 2 is not a prime it factors as this then norm of this equals product of norms of this norm of this is a prime ok. So, since this is a prime over integers this is all these two are also integers product of these two integers is the prime that means one of these two integers must be equal to that prime and the other must be equal to 1. whichever it is. Now, let us see suppose n norm of c plus d square root to minus 2 is 1. By definition norm is 2 d square is 1. Now, c d are integers and this is everything is positive here. So, what would this mean? This means d is 0, d cannot be anything other than 0, and c is plus minus 1. Which means that other the other factor, one of the two factors is simply plus minus 1, which shows that this number a plus b square root of minus 2 is a prime in that larger. So, this is the trick which is very commonly used to establish if a number is prime in the larger rings or not. Okay. Now, let us get back to our proof here t divides 2 y and t divides 2 square root of minus 2. So, what can t be? See, t divides 2 square root of minus 2 and 2 is square root of minus 2 whole square minus of that right. Since t divides 2 square root of minus 2 and this happens to be equal to minus square root of minus 2 whole cube which means that t is basically some power of square root of minus 2. square root of minus 2 square root of minus 2 whole square square root of minus 2 whole cube these are the three possibilities for t right and t divided 2 y as well. So, that would that implies that if t were equal to t was 2 then of course, this is perfectly fine t, t is a square root of minus 2 that is also fine it divides this trivially. If t was square root of minus 2 whole cube then it would imply that y itself is a multiple of square root of minus 2. So, y must be y is an integer. So, y must be even. So, that is what we derive basically either t is uh, if t is 2 or square root of minus 2 then it is fine if it is not then it is going to be uh, y is going to be even ok. And then you go back to this and I think I am just going to leave this proof at some point, but let us continue until we have time. Now, if t is uh, let us say t is 2, 
there are three possibilities of T we have identified square root of minus 2, 2 or square root of minus 2 whole cube. Suppose T is 2 that divides y plus square root of minus 2 ok. As well as this so what would that imply? So, that would mean that should have gone right up here look at this equation and let me ask the question can y be even suppose y is even then right hand side is even which means left hand side must also be even which means x is even if x is even then x cube is a multiple of 4 is actually a multiple of 8, but it is certainly a multiple of 4. So, left hand side is a multiple of 4 which means right hand side must also be a multiple of 4. Since y is even y square is a multiple of 4 then 2 should also be a multiple of 4 which it is not. Therefore, y must be odd. And since y is odd, now let us come to this. We know now that y is odd. Y is odd and t divides y plus square root of 2. Look at the norm. So, y plus square root of 2 can be written as t times something else. Take the norms. What is the norm of y plus square root of 2? It is y square plus 2. Okay. So, that means y square plus 2 can be written as. norm of t times something else. So, what is norm of t? t is only possibilities are for t are square root of minus 2 some power of square root of minus 2. In whatever power it is the norm of t must be even whereas, y square plus 2 is an order. So, that is also not possible. So, the only possibility for t therefore, is that t is 1 that is the only point possible and the fact that t is 1 implies going back that these two y plus square root of minus 2 and y minus square root of minus 2 are do not have a common divisor ok. They do not have a common divisor yet their product is a cube what does it mean? it means that individually they must be cubes ok. Otherwise, this is not possible Now, we can carry this. So, this is already a in fact not just this there is a y minus square root of minus 2 that is also a cube both the factors must be cubes and then we can carry this argument further and derive from this the possible values of y. I am not going to give you complete details, but this is the type of argument one employs when finding out integral solutions of equations. 
and as you see it's very naturally lends to this larger rings and those larger rings actually help finding the solution like this property for example that we have just derived we couldn't have found without going into this larger ring Okay. So I'll just leave it at this point. Now just work it out. It requires a little bit more work. In fact, you can quickly see that C must be equal to A and D must be equal to minus B because it, their product of these two is X Q. Which is x and x is an integer, so that means product of these two must be an integer. So that the only way it is an integer, which is, is that it is equal to a square plus. I mean, when you multiply this and this, you must get a square plus two b square, and that will give us a x. It will also imply that x is equal to a square plus two b square. And y plus square root two is equal to this. So the you already we have now got. Look, both expression of both x and y in terms of a and b, and then we can further argue and find out what values of a and b are possible. So this example also illustrates the same point that these rings are extremely useful in solving the. Problems that we encounter over integers. One of the key thing which I use without proving in this ring admits unique factorization. Otherwise, this whole argument breaks down. So, a ring admitting unique factorization is very important. So, the next question is, which of these rings admit unique factorization? And a lot of work has actually gone into that, and we now know a lot about it, but not the complete picture. So let me give you what we know about this. We have seven and four more. There are four other numbers which are larger, and I don't recall them now. But in the square root of a negative number, of the, there are eight rings which admit. Unique factorization. All other square root of negative numbers do not admit unique factorization. In fact, last time we saw an example of z of square root of minus five that did not admit unique factorization. What about the positive side? The positive side we know. Much less. We know some rings that admit unit factorization. Some that do not but exact situation is not known. That exactly which of this ring z of square root of d where d is positive 
admits unique factorization, which one does not, we do not really. So, that is the state of current knowledge, and that already shows that there are number of interesting problems which are still a challenge to mathematicians to address. We for this course we will not get into those challenges, we will stay with what is very well known. And so, coming back to these rings, uh, we have seen examples of how and why these rings are useful. We also have seen why these rings having a unique factorization is important and we have also seen why some rings do have a unique factorization, some rings do not. Now, the next step is to like I said come up with a notion which allows unique factorization in all these rings and that is where I mentioned already is uh, that is given by the theory of ideals and that is something we will start in the next lecture.